Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to uh, Beetle Board. Uh, we've got Dr. Amanda Button and Dr. John Morgan here to present on um, skeletal dysplasias. Turn over there. I have no idea why the air is so loud. Um, I'm Amanda Bunton. I'm one of the third year OBGYN residents. And this is John Morgan. He's uh, one of our interns. Uh, we're doing our fetal boards on skeletal dysplasias, um, which skeletal dysplasias encompass a heterogeneous group of disorders, and there's over 456 types. Many of them present in the perinatal period, and we can um, pick up findings suggestive of a skeletal dysplasia off of ultrasound, which makes it um, you know, relative to um, obstetrics. So we need to learn how to manage um, these ultrasound findings, know how to recognize findings of a skeletal dysplasia. Uh, and so hopefully this lecture will help us at least know some of the basics. Um, we're gonna start first with a case presentation um, from a patient who recently delivered at EEA Conway. All right, so our patient presentation. Um, the patient is FJ. Uh, she's a 37-year-old African-American female, uh, G6P4014. She presented for her initial prenatal visit, was found to be six weeks and five days by a transvaginal ultrasound on that day. Um, she had no complaints at her initial prenatal visit. Um, her review of systems was negative. Uh, as you can see, her pre uh, past medical history and past surgical history are uh, negative. Um, she's had four previous vaginal deliveries. Uh, one was known to be preterm, uh, around seven months. Um, the baby was four pounds. The baby is still living today. Um, of note, her last pregnancy uh, was with a different father of birth from her first four pregnancies, um, and it was a miscarriage. Uh, was treated with Cytotec. Um, she did not get a DNC. Um, and this is her sixth pregnancy. Um, and like I said, she's six weeks, five days. Um, she has. Uh, negative GYN history. Um, the only medis medicine she's taking is prenatal vitamins. She has no allergies um, and her family history is negative uh, for birth defects, heritable, heritable disorders, and all other um, things we reviewed with her. Um, her prenatal labs uh, were unremarkable, um, pretty much completely normal. Um, so these are some of her notable follow-up visits. Um, on October 3rd, she presented to the emergency department for spotting. Um, she was seen by an OB in the ER. Um, her fetal, fetal heart tones were found with a transvaginal ultrasound, and she was diagnosed with a threatened uh, abortion, and she was discharged home. Uh, she then presented for a clinic visit. Uh, two weeks later, was noted to have continued spotting. Uh, still had fetal heart tones, um, so we just followed her up again. Uh, a month later, she presented um, for another prenatal visit. Um, and her vaginal bleeding had ceased at this time. Um, she was offered McKenna for her previous preterm delivery at seven months, which she um, desired. Um, so they set her up with the social worker to try and get that started. Um, that actually was never approved. She was started on that at 22 weeks, five days um, on January the 8th. Um, her next visit was December 11th. I mean, yeah, December 11th, um, she had a quad screen at that visit, which came back negative, was within uh, normal age-related risk. Um, she had a baseline cervical length for her history of preterm labor, which you see below was 3.2 centimeters. Um, and she had an anatomy scan at that time. Um, the anatomy scan was normal. Um, there was no mention made of, of the fetal um, skeletal um, system. Everything was just said to be normal, um, and she was, then later referred for a uh, level two ultrasound um, for uh, advanced maternal age. So she was seen on December 30th at um, University of Shreveport in the perinatal center for her growth, uh, for her um, level two ultrasound. Um, her growth was found to be normal. Um, her anatomic survey was normal um, besides the uh, angulated left femur, uh, which is consistent with an intrauterine fracture. Um, this was the only long bone that was found to be normal. Um, the right femur and both um, arm bones were, were normal. All the bone lengths were uh, normal as well. Uh, she was offered an amniocentesis at this time for diagnosis, which she declined. Um, she did accept the non-invasive prenatal testing, um, and this was negative for all the trisomies uh, and 
found to be a male fetus. Um, Dr. Bria at that time noted that we were just going to plan for an induction of labor at term. And there was no reason um, to do anything else about it at this point. She was referred to genetics for counseling um, and uh, was scheduled to follow up ultrasound every month or two. So this is the image um, from that ultrasound. You can tell right here the angulated left femur. Um, and we have another image, same thing. So angulated left femur, it was found to be normal length, um, but it was an intrauterine fracture. And then this is her, all of the statistics. Um, you can see her growth was normal um, in every aspect. So she had another ultrasound at 27 weeks, three days. Um, the anatomic survey once again revealed the angulated left femur, which was consistent with fracture and the previous scan. Um, she was found to have mild polyhydramnios, AFI of 24, and her growth was once again found to be normal. This is another image of the femur. You can tell pretty much the same. And once again, her growth is normal. So she saw genetics um, on March 11th. They said that um, likely due to the, the type of fracture, that is likely a mild form of osteogenesis imperfecta type 1. Um, and her family history at that time was unremarkable. Her family history and the father of birth's family history were both completely negative for any birth defects, any history of skeletal dysplasia or anything. Um, she then saw pediatrics the same day. Um, they reassured her that the baby would likely not need resuscitation uh, following birth and that she could deliver at EA Conway uh, with no problems. Um, they, they said that the baby will need blood tests, x-rays, and a genetics consult at birth for any kind of diagnosis of a skeletal dysplasia. Um, and then her follow-up ultrasound at 36 weeks and three days um, was limited due to gestational age. Um, you couldn't even really tell that her left femur had a fracture in this ultrasound. So once again, this is um, the first ultrasound on the 11th. Once again, the angulated left femur. That's the measurement of it. And her growth was normal, 14.3. Uh, and this is a 37-week ultrasound. You can't really tell. Um, it's kind of limited due to the age of the baby. And once again, her growth was normal. So for her delivery, she presented at 37 weeks, five days to EA Conway for a routine visit. Uh, was found to be 390 and bulging bag. Uh, and was sent to the labor unit for monitoring. Her cervix changed to 490 bulging bag and was having contractions every minute um, during the one hour in the labor unit. So she was admitted for uh, active labor. Um, she had subsequently had an uncomplicated SPD um, of a male infant, APGARS were nine and nine. Um, and her postpartum course was unremarkable. Um, she had a tubal ligation on day one um, postpartum. Uh, the baby is DA. Um, like I said earlier, it was delivered uh, via vaginal delivery. Uh, Abgars were nine and nine. Um, the baby's birth weight was six pounds, 3.2 ounces. Um, the baby was alert, uh, had a completely normal physical exam. There was no obvious deformity or angulation on uh, exam of the left femur or the left leg. Um, the sclera were noted to be white. Um, the baby did, however, have a failed um, hearing screening of the left ear, which is a sign of um, osteogenesis, which can be a sign. So the baby had an x-ray of the lower extremities, which noted an old fracture of the left femur. Um, and it had a skeletal survey, which noted no deformities besides the left femur, which had a mid-shaft fracture. Um, no other bony abnormalities were noted. So this is the baby's um, x-ray. You can kind of see the left femur is angulated more so than the right. And that's just another image. The baby had routine, post, uh, routine newborn care, uh, was discharged home on postpartum day two. Uh, we con placed a consult to uh, genetics at uh, University of Health Shreveport. I believe uh, she's set up for a deployment at Shriners uh, sometime in the near future. Um, they ordered a DNA sequencing for collagen, for the collagen 1A and uh, 1A2, and those are still pending. So that's kind of where we are right now. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Button.
Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier how the skeletal dysplasias are a very heterogeneous group of disorders. Um, they are characterized by anomalies of uh, cartilage, bone growth, and development, and they result in abnormal shape, size, and integrity of the skeleton. There's over 456 known types, and overall, um, skeletal dysplasias account for 5% of genetic disorders identified in the newborn period. Some dysplasias are associated with abnormalities in other organ systems, and these may serve as clues in differentiating some of these disorders. Um, and this also points out why it's important to do a thorough ultrasound exam of the different organ systems when a skeletal dysplasia is suspected. Dysplasias begin to manifest in the early stages of fetal development, which is why we care and should know about them. Um, and they can be due to extrinsic or intrinsic causes, with your in extrinsic causes being things like um, teratogens and maternal autoimmune disorders, um, intrinsic dis um, causes being like your single gene disorders that are inherited either autosomal, recessively, dominantly, um, or with the X-linked pattern. Um, they can also be due to imprinting errors or uh, chromosomal abnormalities. So each type of skeletal dysplasia is rare, but when you combine all of them together, um, the overall birth prevalence is 2.4 out of every uh, 10,000. The prevalence during pregnancy is 7.5 for every um, 10,000 screened. With the lethal skeletal dysplasias, their prevalence ranges from 0.95 to 1.5 per um, 10,000 and the overall frequency of perinatal deaths um, due to skeletal dysplasia is nine per 1,000. And this accounts for 23% um, stillborn rate and then 32% who don't survive the first week of life. So as far as the pathogenesis goes, um, it all really depends on which um, skeletal dysplasia we're talking about. Um, you know, there's a ton of different defects, but they all affect embryonic limb development um, through abnormalities at the molecular level. And these defects may involve like extracellular structural proteins, metabolic pathways, um, folding and degradation of macromolecules, hormone and signal transduction mechanisms, nuclear proteins, transcription factors, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, or even RNA and DNA processing and mutation. So we've already concluded that the skeletal dysplasias are rare, so when an abnormality like a short femur length comes up on an ultrasound, you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that the baby has a skeletal dysplasia. You also want to consider other things that are going to be on your differential diagnosis, like IUGR, uh, aneuploidy, just a constitutionally small fetus or non-genetic limb reduction conditions, um, like malformation, disruption, um, deformation. Malformation um, occurs when disorder tissue development occurs from early embryonic teratogen exposure. And this teratogen can be like a viral infection, it could be a medication, it could be radiation, or even diabetes. Um, disruption happens when there's breakdown in normal tissue, like an amniotic band sequence or a vascular accident. And then deformation um, is when there's distorted shape of normal tissue, say like club feet in a patient who's been um, pee prompt for a long time. So these are our different diagnostic modalities that can be used to help us diagnose skeletal dysplasias. Um, they can usually be identified by prenatal ultrasound because most of the skeleton begins to ossify early in the um, pregnancy. The clavicle, the mandible, um, the ilium, the scapula, and the long bones all ossify by 12 weeks. And then between 12 and 16 weeks, um, your metacarpals and your metatarsals ossify. And then at 22 to 24 weeks, your talus and your um, calcaneus ossify. MRI will play a complementary role to ultrasound because it can identify and better define some abnormalities, particularly of uh, the spine, and it's useful because it has no deleterious effects on the developing fetus. 
CT can also provide um, some more detailed images of the spine and the um, pelvic bones, but the radiation exposure will restrict its use. Of course, um, got molecular analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail um, later in the presentation. And then um, fetal autopsy, which should be offered to identify the etiology of the skeletal dysplasia um, is that because it can guide um, management antenatally and then counseling and future pregnancies therefore after. So prenatal screening and diagnosis most often occur in the um, second trimester, but late first trimester fetal structural assessment is becoming more common, and this is because of uh, advances in transvaginal ultrasonography and the widespread use of um, first trimester screening for Down syndrome. Skeletal dysplasias can be suspected because of uh, a qualitative bony abnormality observed on like a routine anatomy scan or because the femur is found to be short for gestational age, or the initial ultrasound may have even been performed because of a family history of skeletal dysplasia. So differentiating these disorders in the prenatal period can be challenging because they are rare. And many of the ultrasound findings are not necessarily pathognomonic for a specific disorder. So a comprehensive assessment of the fetal skeleton is necessary to determine which bones are affected and the type and severity of the abnormalities. And the presence of associated abnormalities in the other systems needs to be assessed as well. Uh, composite findings may or may not lead to a specific skeletal dysplasia. So history may help you with making a diagnosis. Family history of consanguinity, a sibling or a parent affected with the skeletal dysplasia, or even a prior affected fetus can help make um, a diagnosis. So obtaining an accurate family history is critical. And even though making a specific diagnosis may be tough, at least differentiating um, the known lethal disorders from the non-lethal disorders, providing a differential diagnosis before delivery, um, determining post-delivery uh, management plans, and determining accurate recurrence risk to the parents will help improve patient care. So the skeletal dysplasias are associated with um, other anomalies in other organ systems, polyhydramnios being one of the most common associated anomalies, and this is related to a combination of factors including intrathoracic compression of the mediastinum and esophagus by a small chest, uh, micrognathia or associated GI abnormalities. Um, with high drops, um, you see that because of obstruction to uh, normal lymphatic flow because of um, thoracic malformations. And in a lot of the uh, skeletal dysplasias, the skin and the sub-Q uh, layers continue to grow at a faster rate than the uh, long bones. And this causes a relatively, like, thickened appearance of um, the skin folds, which can also be mistaken for high drops on ultrasound. And then um, non-skeletal anomalies like in the cardiac, um, central nervous system, the UG system, and facial anomalies. Okay. Um, these are some guidelines as to how to approach evaluation of a suspected uh, skeletal dysplasia. Um, first thing I'm going to do is um, obtain an accurate gestational age, either by LMP or early dating ultrasound. You measure all the long bones and you want to determine the pattern and the degree of limb shortening. And we'll talk about the different classifications of uh, limb shortening here in a little bit. Uh, measuring the foot length is very important um, because you want to calculate a femur foot length ratio. Uh, assessing the shape and the contour of the long bones for bowing, angulations, and fractures and you want to determine if there's decreased mineralization in the skeleton and whether this decreased mineralization is diffuse or local. Um, determining if this is a lethal condition is also important and we'll talk about that in uh, the next few slides. Um, assessing the skull um, for its shape, size, and mineralization. Um, looking at the facial profile, looking at the vertebra and spine, um, looking at abnormal posturing of the joints, um, 
you want to also evaluate the hands and feet for deformities and abnormal number of digits. And also the growth parameters like your um, AFI and uh, Dopplers. So like I said, all the long bones should be measured to determine the relative shortening against normal values as well as their, their shape, their contour, their mineralization, bowing or angulation, fractures, flaring of the um, metaphys um, metaphysis, absence of individual bones and joint deformities. And these factors can be well visualized on ultrasound at or more than 14 weeks. So bowing, bending, angulation of the femurs um, is really commonly seen in campomelic dysplasia, thanatophoric dysplasia, achondroplasia, and osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, decreased or absent acoustic shadowing is a marker for reduced mineralization of the long bones, which is seen in osteogenesis imperfecta and achondroplasia and um, hypophosphatemia. Normal bone will appear hyperechoic, is brighter white on ultrasound, while poorly mineralized bone is um, less echogenic and will um, look like a lighter gray. Bone fractures can appear as angulations or interruptions in the uh, bone contour or as thick wrinkled contours corresponding to um, repetitive cycles of fractures and then callus formation on top of that. The fetal femur is generally the only long bone routinely measured in the second trimester and it's defined as short when it's below the fifth, um, below the fifth percentile or below two standard devi deviations from the mean for that gestational age. So this definition um, results in a detection rate that exceeds the expected frequency of skeletal dysplasias. So again, you have to consider your differential for um, a mildly shortened femur, which could be like a normal variation, a constitutionally short limb, a false positive um, measurement, IUGR or an aneuploidy like Downs. The majority of isolated short femurs are normal or constitutionally short. Um, if the interim growth over three to four weeks is normal, then a skeletal dysplasia is unlikely. And so about 13% of what is called an isolated short femur um, diagnosed at like 18 to 24 weeks are reclassified as normal on follow-up. However, if the femur length over the uh, three to four week interval falls further from the mean, it should raise the question of skeletal dys dysplasia or um, growth restriction. And you can differentiate between growth restriction um, and because uh, with growth restriction, you may see like a small AC, an abnormal placenta, and abnormal Dopplers. Uh, findings most predictive of a skeletal dysplasia include a femur length um, more than five millimeters below two standard deviations for that gestational age, a femur length to abdominal circumference less than 0.16, and a femur to foot length ratio less than one. So in the majority of skeletal dysplasias, there is um, severe micromelia, meaning like just shortening of um, the entire limb, but the foot is relatively spared. So a normal femur to foot uh, length the ratio is one. So anything less than one usually um, is predictive of a skeletal dysplasia. Okay. Um, and these are a couple examples of um, short femur. And the top picture you see um, just mild shortening um, of the femur, but you can see it's severely um, bowed. And this is a 20 week fetus with um, the diagnosis of a asphyxiating thoracic dystrophy. In the bottom picture, the um, femur and the, the entire limb actually is just severely shortened. Um, this fetus has, is 24 weeks and has a diagnosis of thanatophoric dysplasia type 2. Um, you can also note the uh, redundant um, soft tissue because of the accelerated growth of that um, grown faster than the short um, femur. Okay. So one way to classify skeletal dysplasias is to classify them by the site of the shortened bone. Rhizomelia is a shortening of the proximal segment. So this would be your, um, your femur and your humerus. 
mesomelia, shortening of the middle segment, like your radius, ulna, tib, and fib. Acromelia is shortening of the distal um, segments, like the hands and the feet. And then micromelia is shortening of all parts of the limb, and it's further broken down into um, mild, where um, it's below two standard deviations from the mean for that gestational age, or severe if it's less than three standard deviations. And this is an algorithm um, to help guide diagnosis of skeletal dysplasias based on the classification system that we just talked about. So, um, you know, first you want to classify whether it's rhizomelia, mesomelia, or micromelia. And then um, with micromelia, you want to subclassify is it mild or severe? And then you'll want to look at bowing and fractures versus no bowing. And um, look at whether there's normal mineralization, decreased mineralization, and whether fractures are present or not. And these will just give you some of the um, possible differentials um, depending on what findings you've got. Okay. So secondary evaluation um, of the other bones can be really helpful to further define a specific dysplasia. So you want to make sure you look at the spine, um, the hands and the feet, like a hitchhiker or abducted thumb or first toe is present in um, diastrophic dwarfism. Polydactyly will suggest a group of conditions known as like short rib polydactyly syndrome. Um, the calvarium you want to look at because um, the calvarium usually is really normal or large in a um, skeletal dysplasia while the long bones are disproportionately short. And also one of the most reliable sonographic signs of a lethal skeletal dysplasia is decreased um, mineralization of the skull. And so if you push down with the ultrasound probe on the, um, on the skull, you'll see that the skull can actually be compressed by that. Um, and this can be seen in things like osteogenesis and perfecta type 2, achondrogenesis, and hypophosphatasia. Um, we talked earlier, we want to look at the face and the pelvic bones as well, as well as looking at the uh, cardiovascular, GU, GI, and the central nervous systems. Um, so, prediction of lethality. Um, when a specific skeletal dysplasia cannot be identified, your goal becomes to determine whether the dysplasia is lethal or non-lethal. Okay, diagnostic accuracy is critical because it'll significantly affect um, parental counseling and decision making. Many individuals whose fetuses have a genetic disorder or significant malformation choose not to continue the gestation to term. And it's critical that these fetuses that are presumed to have these skeletal dysplasias that are de delivered pre-viably have appropriate post-mortem evaluations and subsequent counseling um, based on accurate information. For those who do continue the gestation to term, um, pre-delivery consultations and development of a delivery and resuscitation plan with uh, the geneticist, the neonatologist, the obstetricians, and the anesthesiologists will improve the postnatal management of the fetus. So lethality is caused by pulmonary hypoplasia, and that is associated with a small chest circumference. The degree of pulmonary hypoplasia is the most important determinant of lethality. So the lethal group of skeletal dysplasias typically have an earlier onset with the more severe phenotypic um, features in the non-lethal group. Some dysplasias are lethal in the perinatal period and can be detected on antenatal ultrasound. And the non-lethal dysplasias may present in early infancy or childhood with disproportionate um, short stature, failure of um, linear growth, or with just other physical deformities. In retrospective studies, um, ultrasonographers made accurate prenatal diagnosis of the lethal skeletal dysplasias in 81 to 100 percent of cases compared with 31 to 78 percent of all cases of skeletal dysplasias. So the lethal skeletal dysplasias are potentially more amenable to early diagnosis. So pulmonary hypoplasia is really the um, determinant of uh, lethality. The findings suggestive of pulmonary hypoplasia include a thoracic circumference less than 5% and this needs to be measured at the level of the four chamber heart, a thoracic abdominal circumference of less than 0.6, a short thoracic length 
which is measured from the neck to the diaphragm, uh, ribs that encircle less than 70% of the thoracic circumference, a markedly narrow AP diameter, um, a concave or bell-shaped contour of the thorax, or a femur length to abdominal circumference of less than 0.16. Okay. So in this picture on the left, um, this is another example of thanatophoric dysplasia at 23 weeks. Uh, it's a sagittal ultrasound um, demonstrating like the markedly narrow like AP diameter of the chest. You see the heart almost fills the entire thorax and the abdomen looks really protuberant compared to the um, constricted chest. Um, on the right is a fetus with osteogenesis imperfecta type 2 and this coronal ultrasound shows the um, bell-shaped contour of the thorax and the narrow uh, transverse diameter relative to the abdomen. Okay. So now we'll start going over the 456 different types of um, skeletal dysplasias. Just kidding. Um, okay, this is a chart of some of the most common ones and it details the genetic defect that causes it, the inheritance pattern, and some of the common features. Um, I've included some pictures of the three most common lethal types of skeletal dysplasia, which are going to be the thanatophoric dysplasia, um, down here at the bottom, TD1 and 2. Um, this is due um, to a mutation in the uh, FGFR3 receptor. Uh, achondroplasia, which um, also is due to a defect in the FGFR3, and um, osteogenesis imperfecta, um, which is a um, defect in type 1 collagen. So with achondroplasia, you'll see rhizomelic shortening. Again, this is shortening of the more proximal bones like your femur um, and your humerus. Frontal bossing with mid-face hypoplasia, bowed femur, um, with brachydactyly and a trident hand. With osteogenesis imperfecta, you've got severe micromelia, just shortening of the entire limb, um, a poorly mineralized skull, numerous fractures and bowing. You may see beaded ribs, um, palatus spondyly, high drops, um, or kyphoscolosis. And with TD, you'll see severe micromelia with telephone receiver femurs, macrocephaly with frontal bossing, um, hydrocephaly, poly, um, and a cloverleaf skull, which is um, one of the pathognomonic findings. Okay. So this is um, an example of TD2 um, with the cloverleaf skull on the left. In the coronal plane, the cloverleaf skull is, has like a trilobed appearance, and this results from premature fusion of the lambdoid and coronal sutures. And then on the right is an example of the telephone receiver um, femur. You see severe micromelia in TD, um, but it also has a rhizomelic predominance, so the shortening of the proximal limbs. So that's why the femurs are so short in um, this picture, and you see it's kind of curved like a telephone receiver. Um, the extremities can be so foreshortened that they can protrude at like right angles to the body. Okay. Um, on the left is a picture of um, TD at 20 weeks and you can see the white arrow pointing to the um, uh, frontal bossing and then the yellow um, pointing to a flattened nasal bridge. On the right is an example of campomelic dysplasia at uh, 22 weeks, and um, it shows uh, retrognathia and um, very flat faces. Okay. So this is osteogenesis imperfecta type 2 um, at 24 weeks. This is a 2D ultrasound cross-section of the chest, and it demonstrates the, um, the bashed in appearance of the ribs at the lateral aspect of the thorax and this comes from like the elbows hitting the um, the very fragile rib bones and this will cause fractures and angulations um, in those bones. 
And then here on the right is a 3D ultrasound um, sagittal image of the wavy, irregular contour of the ribs due to multiple fractures. Um, you can also see like the ribs are short and they don't encircle the entire thorax. Suggestive of a lethal hypoplasia. Um, this is more of osteogenesis imperfecta type 2. Um, with A, you see a normally uh, mineralized uh, cranium. Compare that with C, where there is an absence of a bright um, wall line like you see here in A. Um, so this means that there is significant demineralization um, present. And then here in B, um, there was mild transduce, transducer presser, um, pressure put on the skull, and you can see how it's caved in. Um, the picture on the right shows the um, beaded ribs because of the multiple fractures and the repetitive callus formation. And then achondroplasia. Um, so on the top left, you see frontal bossing and then the mid-face hypoplasia. Um, the trident hand is one of um, characteristic findings of achondroplasia. And this is um, a hand where the second, third, and fourth fingers are separated. And they're all similar, similar in length. The um, fingers are short and stubby and they've got like a three-prong appearance. So as far as um, antenatal monitoring goes, things to consider um, would be amniocentesis to um, get a karyotype and do molecular testing, um, fetal echocardiogram to assess cardiac structure and function, Serial ultrasound exams to monitor fetal growth, the AFI, and worsening fetal conditions like chi drops. And then prenatal neonatology and genetic consultations to discuss the postnatal management and prognosis of these dysplasias. Okay. So genetic defects have been identified for approximately 70% of the over 456 skeletal dysplasias. Uh, fetal DNA can be obtained through um, chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis and can be analyzed for gene mutations. And usually a fetal karyotype and a, a microarray analysis is performed too. When to perform um, molecular analysis depends on um, the situation. For a couple with a prior affected fetus but is due to a new dominant disorder, there's no consensus whether molecular diagnosis should be performed because there's a relatively low risk of a germline mutation. And the risk for miscarriage associated with the invasive prenatal procedure is higher than the risk for the fetus to be affected. And furthermore, fetal ultrasound is reliable in making a relatively early diagnosis. However, when both parents are affected with the same or different autosomal dominant skeletal disorder, the fetus is at high risk for um, lethality, and so molecular diagnosis is definitely useful in this situation. Um, when one parent has an autosomal recessive skeletal dysplasia and the risk of an affected fetus is relatively low, the appropriateness of molecular diagnosis is less clear. Now, as far as obstetric management goes, um, delivery in a tertiary care facility is recommended. Um, Caesarean delivery should be considered for skeletal dysplasias associated with bone fractures and a poor mineralization. Um, also, C-section if the patient herself has a skeletal dysplasia. Um, many fetuses with both lethal and non-lethal skeletal dysplasias delivered um, at or near term have a relative macrocephaly and vaginal delivery may not be accomplished, so then C-section again should be considered in those. So many fetuses with non-lethal skeletal dysplasias can have some respiratory compromise in the immediate newborn period, so um, that's a good thing to be aware of. Um, make sure you've got your neonatologists and pediatricians at delivery. With uh, lethal skeletal dysplasias, neonatal resuscitation is generally not recommended. 
comfort care, supportive measures um, are appropriate, and this also will help the parents have time to accept the lethal nature of the anomaly as well. You want to continue the diagnostic assessment, so um, obtaining skeletal, spinal, and cranial radi radiographs, and doing um, molecular testing. And then consultation with the geneticist to help with formulating a diagnosis and providing um, prognosis and um, risk factors for future pregnancies. Now the prognosis depends on which skeletal dysplasia is suspected or diagnosed as well as on the associated anomalies. Long-term morbidity includes short stature, varying degrees of orthopedic complications, developmental delay, and learning disabilities. Um, Long-term survivors of skeletal dysplasias may have a shortened lifespan. And then finally, these are some really good resources that can be consulted when um, local expertise is unavailable or the diagnosis cannot be determined. So there's an International Skeletal Dysplasia Registry and a European Skeletal Dysplasia Network that has a lot of good information um, about a lot of these skeletal dysplasias. And that's it. Any questions? depending on underlying process for osteogenesis and perfected is the uh, defect in the collagen and defect in the mineralization so in terms of going through reabsorption, callus formation they still go through it but they don't form normal bone so the process in terms of priming regeneration is the same in terms of the body they belong both in terms of the body and the you leave them alone with time to be mall and we said that certainly happened postnatally and we and others have documented that and uh, the, the key issue as there's a nice presentation about the lethal skeletal dysplasia about not to jump on a chest because at the end you create more hassles than benefit you're not breaking the ribs and everything else so these are the things where the counseling come in that's important at the front end 